Hey everyone, welcome to the Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is Jared, and I'm the group's resident here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Our mission is simple, to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. And so whether you've been following Jesus your whole life or your journey has just begun, we hope that this message will help you draw near to the person of Jesus, be challenged and encouraged by his word, and be moved to action. We hope these next few moments are a blessing to you and equip you to see who God really is and who you are in him. Man, it is such a joy to be back with you again, especially today as what we're doing is we are wrapping up this six-week series we've been working our way through at, at all four Zero Collective churches, and we've been taking a deep dive and really looking deeply at Psalm 23, this incredible psalm in the Bible. And what we've been doing is every single week we've been looking at a different verse, a different line of it, and we've been inviting uh, ourselves to just allow the truth of Psalm 23 to speak to different lies that we tend to believe about ourselves and about our world that we live in and even our relationship with God. And so I want to begin uh, this morning with just a simple question. I, I want to ask you, what do you bring to the table? That, that, is, that is a question I guarantee most of us have heard in this room. It's a question you hear getting asked a lot. We ask this question in job interviews, right? If, if I were to hire you, if we were to hire you, what exactly do you bring to the table? Uh, this question is asked in dates with potential spouses, It's usually where the date starts to go downhill, right? If we were to get married someday, what exactly do you bring to the table? Uh, We hear this question asked even when it comes to sales pitches for products and services. If I buy in to, to whatever it is you're selling, what exactly do you bring to the table? And we all know when this question gets asked, what we're expected to do is to list our qualifications, our merits, our skills, whatever it is. Everybody in this room and everybody watching online, I guarantee you have something in your mind some good aspect, some uh, bright part of who you are that you would say, I know how I would answer that question. What do you bring to the table? When I was 17 years old uh, in high school, I took a class called independent living. Some of you may have had that exact same class. Maybe it was called home ec uh, when you went to school, but basically it was like teaching life skills. And so I remember at the beginning of one particular week, the teacher said to us, Uh, At the end of this week, we are going to make a cherry pie together. That's what we're going to do. Everybody, we're going to all learn how to make a cherry pie. And she told us that all the ingredients were going to be provided for us except one. So there was only one ingredient that I, as a student, was expected to bring to the table. And the ingredient was cherries. Beautiful, bright red cherries. That Everything else is going to be provided. That's the one thing I had to bring to the table for this assignment to make a cherry pie. Well, the week went on, I forgot all about it. So literally the night before I'm watching TV at my parents' house and suddenly I go, oh man, that's right. Tomorrow is the day we're supposed to make that cherry pie. I, you know, I gotta go find cherries. And so I I remember I went to my parents' deep freeze and I opened it up and it just so happened that a couple months before that, we had moved my grandma from the home she lived in for years and years into like an assisted living place. And my grandma, all her life, she, you know, she canned her own vegetables. She preserved her own fruit. And so I remember opening my parents' deep freeze and lifting out. Sure enough, there was this container. And on the container, in a label written in my grandma's own handwriting, it said, cherries. 1965. (laughs) And I thought to myself, bingo. (laughs) Success. So I set the cherries out on the table to thaw overnight. And the next day I brought them into class to make the cherries. Here's what I remember about that experience. I remember at the end of class, uh, my pie from the outside looked exactly like everybody else's pie. But when you cut into my pie, instead of these bright red cherries, the the cherries I had in my pie were like sort of like gray and wrinkly. Kind of like my grandma, actually. They reminded me (laughs) of my grandma, as a matter of fact. (laughs) What I had brought to the table was inadequate, and my grade showed it. I had one job, bring cherries. That's the one thing I had to bring to the table. We've all had moments in our lives where what we, fe- we have felt like, man, what I'm bringing to the table is just inadequate. My friend Greg Dempster talks about how we all learn from the time we're very little to live by the performance equation. This is what he, he refers to the performance equation as my performance plus people's approval of me equals my value. 
This is the equation that our entire world is based on. This is what we learn from a very young age to live by. If I perform well in work, in school, with grades, as a mother, you know, at home, whatever it is, my performance, if I do all that, plus people's approval of that performance, well, that equals my value. That's the sum, t- that's the sum total of what I bring to the table. And when we grow up in a world like this and where we're constantly, uh, you know, believing this, it leads to believing the big lie that we're talking about this morning. And the big lie that we're talking about today is this lie that no one will love me if I don't perform. What do, I, what do I bring to the table? My performance plus people's approval of that equals my value and no one's gonna love me if I don't perform. If I don't show up, if I don't bring something, there's not a space in this world, there's not a relationship I'm gonna live in where I'm gonna be valued unless I perform. This is what we know to be true. And today, what we're going to wrap up this series, is we're looking at Psalm 23, verse 5. And verse 5 speaks directly to this lie that we tend to believe. So this is Psalm 23, verse 5. It says this, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Now, we're only looking at one verse today, okay? So I'm going to read it again. And this time, I want you to really let it sink in what King David is saying with this psalm. He's speaking to God. And he says, you, God, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. I just want to spend the next few minutes that we have together here talking and and unpacking the truth of that verse. So if you've been with us these last six weeks, you know Psalm 23 uh, is, deals with a metaphor. It deals with this imagery. And all, all this entire time we've been looking at it, Psalm 23 talks about a shepherd with his sheep. That's the imagery. That, that's the metaphor that we've been given. It begins, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. It's this imagery of a, of a shepherd guiding his sheep. That's what we've been looking at. But when you get to verse five, what's interesting is suddenly the psalm takes a right turn and no longer are we talking about a shepherd and sheep. Suddenly now the imagery changes and we're talking about a generous host preparing a table for some honored guests, right? Sheep don't tend to eat at tables that have been prepared for them. Would that be your experience as well? Now, some people have pointed out, well, you know, a shepherd would anoint the head of a sheep, you know, to treat cuts and scrapes and bugs and all that stuff. And that's true, but also in the ancient Near East, if you were an honored guest at a table, what would often happen as a way to honor you is your head would be anointed with oil when you would recline at the table as an honored guest. And then also it says, my cup overflows, which again seems to go better with, you know, an honored guest at a table rather than sheep. And so suddenly David is is changing the imagery and he's saying God is like this generous host. Now here's what's unique about this. He says, you, God, as the host, you prepare a table before me. Now, to prepare a table meant to prepare the food. That's what it meant, which is interesting because in the ancient world, a person of status would never prepare food. They would have a servant that would prepare the food. So the host would provide the food. The host would pay for the food, but someone else would prepare it. And what King David says is, no, God, the generous host of Psalm 23, verse 5, you are prepare a table before me. He, he provides it. He pays for it. He prepares it. In other words, God does all the work. He does all of it. He provides it, pays for it, prepares it, puts it in front of him. You have prepared this table for me. That's what the imagery we're given is of, is of this generous host preparing the table and inviting us to come and to experience it, what he's provided. What, what an incredibly beautiful picture. Now, why does that matter? It matters because what we're given here in in this picture of a table is we're given a picture of what we have at the table of God. What we have with life with God is a picture of relationships and purpose. That's what we're invited into. Think about it. It says, you prepare a table before me. So at this table, I have status. I have relationships. I'm not alone. I'm, I'm not being judged. I'm not being condemned. I belong. I'm at this table where, where I'm welcomed. So I have relationships, but then also it says, my cup overflows. And in the ancient Near East, that, that was a symbol of, uh, of productivity, of work, of abundance. 
It's, it's not something where I, I, I'm having to prove myself or I'm having to earn it. It's something where I have purpose, I have meaning, my cup overflows, there's abundance. Why does that matter? Here's why that matters. If you think about what are the two areas that every single human being struggles in throughout their entire life, it's these two areas. Whatever is heavy in your life right now, I bet you could sum it up under one of those two headings, or maybe both of them. Relationships and purpose is where we struggle the most in our lives. And it's no wonder. If you begin the, at the very beginning of the Bible, the story of humanity really sums it up. Adam and Eve, the first human beings, when they are exiled from the Garden of Eden because they disobey God, they, you know, they break relationship with him and they're exiled, what it says is they, their relationships are broken. So the relationship with God and the relationship with each other is fractured and damaged. But also when they're exiled from the garden, their, their sense of purpose with creation itself is broken. In the garden, they were supposed to be co-caretakers, co-creators with God, caring for the creation. But when they get out of the garden, when they're exiled, it says now a man is going to work by the sweat of his brow. There's going to be thorns. He's going to toil. And every single human being from that moment in human history to now, sitting here right now in this room, these are the two areas everybody struggles in. Everybody. Relationships and purpose. What's interesting is if maybe some of you'd say, uh, man, I, I, I've got relationships. Maybe you have really meaningful, full relationships in your life. But if you have relationships and you struggle with purpose, then the way this lie that we're talking about begins to affect you is you will begin to perform in every relationship you have to gain approval. In fact, performing for people and pleasing people will become your purpose in life as you believe this lie. For others of you, maybe you'd say, no, I have a really meaningful sense of purpose. Maybe you have a job, a career that pays you well and you're successful, but you're lacking in relationships. Well, what will happen is you believe this lie is you will begin to perform more and more in your area of work and purpose. You'll, you'll live your life for more accomplishment, more money, whatever it is. But at the end of your life, you'll find yourself alone with no one to share it with. And right now, more and more people are writing about how our world right now, we are in a loneliness epidemic. We're more connected digitally and with devices than ever before, and yet we're more isolated and more lonely than we've ever been. And what we're told in Psalm 23, 5, is the table that God wants to prepare before us, the life he wants us to experience, is a full life where we are welcomed in, where we have relationships and we have purpose. We have meaning. We have a place. Isn't that beautiful? So the real question then that, that we need to talk about <laughs> is the question, so why don't we experience life at God's table? Even if you've grown up in church, why is it that so many of us were not experiencing what Jesus or what God offers at, the, at his table? A full life of relationships and purpose. I'll go even a step further. For some of us, it's not, even that you, it's not just that you're not experiencing a full life of relationships and purpose at the table of God. For some of you, you'd say, no, actually, I, I'm experiencing the opposite. Church is the place I feel the most judged. Maybe it's in your relationship with God where you'd say, man, I've, I've, that's where I feel like I have to perform the most. That's where I feel like I've got to measure up and bring something to the table the most, and it's never enough. In fact, maybe you're, you're only here today at church or maybe the only reason you're watching online is because that, then you can check a box and say, that's one more good thing I did to hopefully it will outweigh all the bad things I've done in my life. For many of us, this is our entire relationship with God. If, if we're not careful, what ends up happening is our Christian life will be nothing more than a manifestation of human effort. But God has not asked us to perform our Christianity so that we earn a seat at his table. Our seat at God's table has already been paid for, the gospel tells us, by Jesus' performance on the cross on our behalf. And so now we have his seat at the table. Through nothing that we've done, through nothing that we bring, through nothing that no good skill or ability would win us, it's just what he's provided for us. That's the gospel invitation that we sometimes, not sometimes, we oftentimes drift away from and miss. 
Now, if you think this lie affects you, affects maybe some other people, but it doesn't affect pastors like me, you're wrong. Let me tell you exactly how this lie has affected me in my life. This lie that, that my performance plus people's approval equals my value, and therefore, if I don't perform, I'm not going to be loved. For many years, it, uh, when I was in my early 30s, when I, uh, pastoring this very church, uh, for years, what I would do is I was obsessed with the numbers. I've talked with you about this before. Some of you remember this. Uh, and here's what I remember is every single Sunday after church was over, after I was done preaching the message, after I was done talking and praying with people, before I could go home, I would go and I would find the clipboard. You know what the clipboard is? I don't know if you guys even still have it here. I'm not sure if we, if we still even do this here, but at, at one time there would be like during the sermon, during, during the message, there would be like a guy walking around the back of the room with a clipboard. And what, the, what he's doing is he's, if you're wondering, if we, I don't even know if we still do it, he, he's counting heads. That's what he's doing. He, he's counting or butts and seats or whatever. And then he'd go over here, you know, how many people came to, to the worship center? How many, came, uh, how many people came to hear me preach? That's what, the way I thought about it. How many people came and dropped their kids off in the kids ministry? What, what was that attendance number? And before I could go home, I knew where the clipboard was kept. I knew the drawer where it was kept. And so before I could go home on a Sunday afternoon, I had to go and I had to look at that clipboard and I had to know what the number was. And here's the thing. If the number was good, I felt good about me. And if, if the number was bad or wasn't what I was hoping for, or wasn't what I was expecting, I felt bad about me. And this went on for a number of years. And, and what finally kind of began a, a, a change for me was uh, my wife, Carrie, she and I have been married for 25 years. We have four boys now. Um, and she, uh, she confronted me. I remember one Sunday afternoon, our, our boys were still young back then. I remember uh, I must have been in a bad mood after church. And I remember she just says to me, Brian, did you know I can tell what the numbers were at church by the way you come home? She says, I can tell. If the numbers were good, I know it because you come in that door and you are a great dad. You're a great husband. And she said, but, but I can also tell when you come in the door, I can tell if the numbers were bad because for the rest of the day, the boys don't even want to be in the same room with you. And then she said, and neither do I. <laughs> Ouch. She was right. She was 100% right. Now, how, how did I get there? You know, like how in the world did I start believing that lie? But you can rewind the clock. I, I literally have this memory of uh, being eight years old in, in my home growing up. I mean, these things are very deeply rooted from the time we're kids. And uh, what I remember in my home growing up, um, whenever my uncle would come over to hang out, my dad and my uncle would sit at our dining room table in, in our house and they would drink whiskey together. I don't know what your family was like, okay, but my family, my uncle would come over and they would sit at the table and they would drink whiskey together. And here's what I remember. They would have the most incredible conversations. My dad and my uncle both are really incredibly intelligent, smart people. So I remember being an eight-year-old, like in the next room, and I remember listening to them. It's such a ridiculous memory. I literally remember listening to them talk. And I remember thinking like, man, they're using these big words to an eight-year-old. It's like they're using these giant words, these giant vocabulary words. And I wanted so badly to go in that room and I wanted to be at that table. I wanted to be talking with them. You know how it would go, like the more whiskey they drank, you know, the more in interesting the conversations became, the louder the conversations became. And so I literally have this memory of, uh, of, this is so ridiculous. I remember going to my parents' bookshelf and pulling out a dictionary and opening up this dictionary. And I remember memorizing what to me were like big fancy words. Like, oh, I'm going to memorize this word. And then what I tried to do is I tried to just sort of like stroll into the room while they're sitting at the table and like drop some sentence with some big fancy vocabulary word that I, that I had learned. Isn't that silly? We all have like ridiculous memories like that. But, but I mean, there's a, you can draw a straight line. Fast forward to me in my early 30s. I mean, do you see it? I'm still walking into a room and I'm trying to drop some big words on a stage so that hopefully people will accept me at the table. Do you see it? And the numbers were the evidence that I was approved of. This lie affects us. And that's me. That's not you guys. None of you are struggling like that. But you, you've got something. You've got your own thing. What, what is the table that you're trying to be accepted at? Where are you believing this lie that nobody's going to love me unless I perform, so I better show up and I better bring something to the table? Where is that space in your life? Do you want a hint? If you're wondering, 
think about the places where you feel the most judged. Because here's what we do. That wherever those areas are that we're trying to measure up, that we're trying to perform so that we can be approved of, so that we can be loved, so that we can be accepted, we will appoint ju- judges to judge us. For me, it was the clipboard and the numbers. But for some of you, it's the scale. Every morning, the scale judges you. The mirror judges you. You're ne- you never are quite beautiful or thin or whatever enough, even into, well into your adult years. For some of you, it's the bank account. And the fact that this amount of, of money is not in there, that every single day, that, that's the sum total of your value and your worth, and you just can't, can't ever quite get there. The bank account judges you. For some of you, it's your failures. It's your past judges you. For others of you, it's your age is judging you every single day. And I think the worst one, when you get to be my age, you get to a point where your kids' choices judge you. Somehow what they decide to do or don't decide to do is somehow a reflection on you and the way you lived your life and how good a job you did. This is what we do. I could go on and on and on. You get the picture. Wherever those places are in your life where you're feeling constantly judged, that's the table you're trying to be accepted at. That's the place you're trying to bring some sort of approval. That's the place you're just torturing yourself to try to show up and be approved of. I came here today to open Psalm 23, verse 5, and I came to ask you the question, have you had enough? Are you tired of performing? Are you worn out from living by the performance equation all the time? My performance plus people's approval equals my value, and that's the sum total of my entire life. Are you tired of that? Do you want some good news? Do you? Good, because there's some good news. (laughs) So now now that I've gotten you thoroughly depressed, Uh, which was my goal. Um, Here's the good news. There's something so incredibly powerful in this uh, one verse that we miss so much of the time. What's so fascinating is David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. It's a strange line, isn't it? He's describing a full life with God, the best life that we could possibly have. So the question I'd love to just ask is, why is it a table in the presence of my enemies? You ever wondered that? Like, why wouldn't it be a table in the presence of my friends? A table in the presence of my family, people who love me, people who actually care about me. That's the table. When I think of like, what's a great life? What's a full life with God? That's what I think of. It's a table celebrating all in eternity with my best friends. My enemies aren't even in the picture. That's not what King David says. King David literally says a picture of a full life with God is he prepares a table for, before me in the presence of my worst enemies. Well, think about this for a minute. If they're my enemies, then what does that make me at the table? I'm their enemy, aren't I? In a sense, the way you could think about the, the, the way David is phrasing this, he's saying, I come to the table as an enemy, but God's prepared this table and he's prepared this seat for me, even though I'm coming as an enemy to sit, sit with my enemies. What a strange picture. Why would David do this? Here's what's really amazing is, you know, King David, we know, wrote this psalm. And uh, we know a lot about King David's life. So much of his life is recorded in the Old Testament. So you can write this down and go read it later. There's an entire chapter of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9. There's an entire chapter where it tells a story of Dave, uh, in David's life about a guy named Mephibosheth. That's the guy's name. Any pregnant ladies here looking for baby names? <laughs> Mephibosheth. There you go. Nobody's going to have that name. All right. So Mephibosheth, here, here's what uh, the story tells, sum up the whole chapter of the Bible. Basically, in ancient times, what would happen, would be common practice, is that when, uh, when one king would come in and take over a regime change, would happen and would take over for the previous uh, king, what would happen is the king's men would go through and find all the previous like, king's surviving family members and would put them to death. And this was common practice. And the reason for this is because you didn't want, as the new king, you didn't want some surviving family member of the previous king's family, you know, making a play for your throne someday. You know, gathering some people and getting some political support and then making a play for your throne. You didn't want that happening. So that was common protocol, was common practice. You would go through, you would find all the surviving members of the family of the previous king and you would put them to death. So 
what happens is when David comes into Jerusalem, when he becomes king over Israel, that's exactly what happens. David's men do what you did in that time. And they went through and they found all the surviving family members of King Saul's family and put them to death, except one. They missed one. At the time, Mephibosheth is an infant. And what it says is as the king's men are coming, the nurse that's watching over him picks him up and begins to run away. And as she runs away, she drops him. And for the rest of Mephibosheth's life, he, he grows up disabled. He's crippled in both feet. He can never walk normally again. And he ends up surviving and escaping, but he grows up in hiding as a disabled person, hoping that he's never going to be discovered. And in 2 Samuel 9, they find him. And he knows this is, this is probably the end. And so David's men come to David and they say, hey, we found this guy. He's the last surviving member of Saul's family. This is now years later. He's a, he's a grown man. And, and King David's men say, what do you want us to do with him? And in this shocking turn of events, completely breaking protocol in this beautiful act of grace, David says, I want you to bring Mephibosheth to me. So they bring him to King David and, and he, he says, oh man, this is the end. I'm going to be put to death. And instead, King David says, for the rest of your life, Mephibosheth, I want you to live in my house, in the king's palace. But even more than that, every single night, you're going to eat at the king's table. Now, you have to understand, in that time, it was a great honor to be asked to eat at the king's table. You didn't just get that that just, you had to be someone of status. You had to be someone who was worthy. You had to bring something to the table if you wanted to eat at the king's table. And literally this guy who's crippled in both feet, who's, a, who's an enemy, he's the previous king's regime, family member, you're gonna eat at my table the rest of your life. Now, why did David do this? Scholars have debated this, right? There are theological reasons. Maybe there's, you know, political reasons. He was trying to win favor with this group of people. That, you know why I think he did it? David had an enemy at his table every single day because he had come to a place in his life where he understood that he was the enemy at God's table. And God had prepared a place for him. Some of the worst sins you'll ever read about were, belonged to David in the Old Testament. And again and again, God shows him grace. David understood who he was. He understood how he got to God's table. That's why he's able to write these words. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The only way a guy like David can extend grace to a guy like Mephibosheth is because that guy understands that he was the enemy at God's table and God made a place for him. And it's the same for the rest of us. We cannot extend grace to others. We cannot live out of the overflow and the abundance of our seat at the table, our identity that's secure in Christ unless we understand that we were the enemies at God's table. When you receive the truth that you were the enemy at God's table and he prepared a place by Jesus' death on the cross so that you could have his seat, what happens is you stop performing to try to earn your place at God's table. And instead, those places where you feel judged, those places where you feel like you don't measure up, those places are the places in your life you start learning to trust him. Those become the places of deep trust and abiding in your relationship with God. That's what happens. For me, I mean, what's changed as this truth has continued to work its way into my life and, in, and out into all of my relationships, here's what I can genuinely say to you. I can stand here and genuinely say to you that for me, I am free today to love you without needing your approval. That's what's changed. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm not, I don't mean this offensively. I care about you. I love you. I love all the people and all the congregations of all the Zero Collective churches. But you need to understand, I don't need you to approve of me. I don't need you to like me. I don't need you to need me. Instead, what's changed for me is this morning, I want you to have what I have. I want you to be free. And you don't get there by just trying to perform better and better and better each time. So I want to ask that question one more time. I want to bring it back up. What do you bring to the table? What do you bring to the table? In terms of your relationship with God, we all have an answer to that question. I love what 18th century preacher Jonathan Edwards said about this subject. He said, you contribute nothing to your salvation 
except the sin that made it necessary. He just wants you. He just wants you. All of you. That's what he wants at the table. That's the invitation. Come to him. Stop performing. Those places where, you, where you're not measuring up, where you feel judged, trust him. That's where you trust him. On the night Jesus was betrayed, Jesus prepared a table. And what he did, Luke 22 tells us that Jesus took bread and he broke it for his disciples, his 12 disciples sitting at the table. And he said, this is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took a cup and he said to his disciples, this is my blood, which was shed for you. It's poured out for you. And do this in remembrance of me. And so for centuries, and we're going to do it this morning, the church, the people of God have been remembering the truth of what we're talking about this morning. The truth that that we are invited to the table, not on our own merit, our own performance, but on Jesus' performance, on his broken body, on his shed blood. That's what's earned us our seat at the table. And we're invited to come and remind ourselves and remember who we are in Christ because of who he is and what he's done. And I want to remind you tonight, today, It's a part of the story we often don't talk about. I want to to remind you that at the table that Jesus prepared that night, there was an enemy. And Judas, the betrayer, ate too. Sometimes we have this tendency to think, this isn't for me. I, I don't measure up. I don't have all these things figured out in my life. This is for you. It's for you. This is what you need. Not a better plan to improve yourself so that you show up and bring something to the table a little better next time. What you need is the grace of God permeating every single area of your life. And so in a moment, uh, I'm gonna offer a prayer and then we're gonna have an extended time of worship. And uh, if you haven't noticed, there's tables all around this room. And there are people at these tables. And um, whenever you're ready, as we're worshiping, you can come forward. And the elements are on the table, the, bo- the bread and the, the cup. And um, we're going to serve you. We've prepared a table. <laughs> and uh, we're going to serve you the elements as you come forward. But I would be remiss if I didn't uh, give you an option here. As Whenever we talk about this message, whenever we talk about uh, the gospel of grace, about how we get to our place at the table, what it involves on our, our end is believing and receiving. So there, there's a card um, that's on your, your seat. It's there all over the room. And uh, in John 1.12, Jesus said, or in, in John 1.12, the writer John said, to all those who believed and received him, believed and accepted him, he gave the right to be children of God. He gave the right to have a seat at the table. So today maybe is a day where you take this card and you check one of those boxes and maybe this is the only thing you need to bring to the table is your surrender. Bring your surrender to the table. (laughs) Bring your white flag of saying, I'm tired of trying to do it myself. I'm tired of trying to fix myself. I'm tired of trying to perform my way up into being worthy of it. And maybe you need to give your life to Jesus for the first time, or maybe maybe for you it represents a recommitting, a coming back, a, a fresh surrender again, and saying, Lord, I need you. I need you in every area of my life. <laughs> we didn't get to this table on our effort. Would you bow in prayer with me? I'd love to just lead us in a prayer. And if that's you, would you just make this a confession of your heart? And then as we worship and sing, and you can uh, you can head to the communion table. And I just want to invite you to bring those cards with you. If you fill out that card, bring it with you and drop it at the communion table. Drop your surrender at the communion table and receive the elements. That's what we're inviting you to do. So Jesus, this morning we come to the table of grace. We come to the throne of I will do it for you. We just recognize, Jesus, this morning that the most scandalous thing about your table is not who you keep out. The most scandalous part of your table is who you let in. 
So we come as the enemy to the table, recognizing that we're here because of the grace you've shown us. And we ask you to transform us from the inside out, from our seat at the table as a child of God, as a dearly loved son, as a dearly loved daughter. Would you allow us to extend that same grace to every other relationship in our life? Would you help us to find true welcome, true relationship, true purpose at your table so that we can offer it so that our body and our blood can be broken and spilled for the rest of the world as your hands and your feet as your church. That's what we ask, Jesus. Would you come into our lives, God? Would you, once again, would you be our Lord and our Savior? Would you show us the way as we trust and put our faith and our trust in you? Those deep places of hurt where we feel like we've got to perform and we don't measure up, I pray that you would transform those into deep places of trust in you. That's what we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. We hope this message encouraged you in seeing who God is and who you are in him. If you want to take a next step, visit frontlinegr.com slash next. We look forward to connecting with you there and we'll see you back here next week.